welcome to Canonical, a conversation about books. I'm James Xiao, and I'm joined, as always, by Yad Deris. Hello. Yad, how are you doing? I'm all right. And Sam Spieler. Hello. Sam, how's Portland? Portland is rainy, yeah. as it often is, yes. But it's nice. Today, we are concluding our series on pandemic literature. Uh, we started with Catherine Ann Porter's Pale Horse, Pale Rider, and then we followed that up with Jose Saramago's Blindness, and we finished with Emily St. John Mandel's Station Eleven. So uh, we started this because we are currently in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, and I think we wanted to explore how the pandemic experience is conveyed in fiction. Uh Porter actually lived through the 1918 flu pandemic, whereas uh, Saramago and Mendel didn't really experience anything on that level of um, cataclysm. Did you guys find Porter's depiction of Pale Horse, Pale Rider to be any more real in any sense? I think it is more realistic, not necessarily because Porter lived through the actual pandemic, but rather just because the scale of her story is a human story, it's a human scale, and the experience of COVID-19 is also experienced at my own personal human scale. I think that this gives her the advantage of telling a more relatable and more moving story, but she doesn't really capitalize on it. I think she also misses the opportunity to show us the spectacle of post-apocalyptic America in the way that Station Eleven shows us, and she also misses the opportunity to philosophize on the meaning of this sort of event the way that Saramago does. So she kind of misses the boat for me. Yeah, it's it's definitely more immediate. It's more personal because it's, like you say, it's told at a human scale, a singular human scale. But she's her Concerns with the book are not the same concerns as Saramago or Mandel. Saramago is, well, both Saramago and Mandel are telling very fictionalized versions. Yeah. The only post apocalyptic, true post apocalyptic book here was Station Eleven. Right. What I mean here is not to say that Porter should have written something more similar to Station Eleven or Blindness, but rather. Because she's telling a different kind of story, she has a certain advantage that they don't have, and she didn't lean into that advantage. She could have focused much more on the human costs and the human experience of the pandemic, but I felt like that wasn't done enough. Yeah, I guess I could agree with that. It's a bit too short for her to do too much. I think she she definitely had a lot of space that she could have expanded on things. But we spend the whole time inside Miranda's head, really. So, Sam, did you find that to be more real in any sense? No. Um, but real is a tricky term. Uh, I felt blindness for me was the most, well, I, yeah, I, I found blindness the most effective and the most tough, the, the, the scariest, I guess. I had, um, yeah, I agree. I had the most visceral reaction to blindness. Yeah. Uh, but it's not real. So even at its scariest, real is just a little too tricky of a term, I think, for, for this. I will say, though, that Station Eleven, well, all three of the books did bring something special and uh, alarming, I guess, to how I was thinking about things. Uh, for Station Eleven, even though... Most of it takes place afterward. The end of the first section where we're still getting Jeevan's point of view and things start to happen, the pandemic starts to actually hit. Uh, I remember texting you guys to say, oh, here it goes. It's really similar. And of course, immediately after that, the similarities disappeared. But the end of that first section started to feel very real in terms of what was happening here in the real world with COVID-19. So I have a question. Uh, we're talking about something, a piece of fiction feeling more real. 
maybe we should take a slight detour right now and just talk about what, what makes it feel more real to you. Like what makes a generic work of fiction feel real? This is something that I had mentioned previously, not in terms of feeling real in relation to our world, but feeling real in relation to the world of the novel. When I criticized Station Eleven, I said it felt contrived because I could see all of the choices that Mendel was making in creating that novel as a result of a particular persona or type of person. So it felt like artifice. And I think that is something that really can destroy this illusion of realism, whether or not it's realism in relation to our world or the world of the novel. If it just feels made up, it definitely can't be real. Well, to to probe that a little bit more, I mean, blindness has a very distinct way of telling the story in that uh, Saramago doesn't use punctuation. Yeah. And it really stands out. Um, And he also, the narrator is quite distinctive. He intrudes on the storytelling quite a bit. But what do you think makes that feel more real? You know, even though that's a narrator that's more busy or the the voice or the um, the form is more busy. It kind of um, distracts you in a way. Well, the details were, uh, to use Ied's term, visceral. They painted a very clear and awful picture throughout. Uh, whereas with Station Eleven, there were moments where we get this uh, bleak world and moments where we get this beautiful world but i kept noticing terms that popped up like the word beauty and it seemed a little too explanatory for me i felt like the the world was explained to me more than in blindness where it was it was painted so is it as basic as showing not telling at least to some degree um but the way blindness, uh, even with the intrusions, just the style in general made it a lot more personal feeling. It felt a lot closer, whereas Station Eleven always felt pulled back a distance. What about the author's um, understanding of human nature or his or her ability to kind of convey that via fiction? Do you think that might make something feel more real? Oh, Definitely. I think that was also one of my problems with Station Eleven is that the a lot of the treatments were, as I mentioned in that episode, overviews of various things. So overviews of cult leadership, overviews of post-apocalyptic life. It, it wasn't super detailed. I think in Station Eleven most of the main characters really just function more as avatars for Mandel herself rather than as distinct personas. So, while they have some life, they don't have distinct lives from the author herself, it would be difficult for a writer who doesn't really understand human nature to craft characters that were distinct from the author but also realistic. So I think that's one of the limitations that Mandel might be running into. We talked a lot about um, those two novels, but what about Pale Horse, Pale Rider? I think that with that novel in particular, it's very difficult for me to separate Miranda from Porter herself. So I would be inclined to say that it's realistic, but it's realistic in the same way that uh, Station Eleven is realistic, only that the character has a life of her own, a real life of her own, because she's so closely connected to the author. So in terms of commercial success, um, and I, I'm not going off of any numbers here, but I think that Station Eleven has achieved the most commercial success um, out of these three, Saramago's obviously really famous because he's won, you know, the big prize. But uh, Station Eleven was a huge seller back in its day. Do you think that people who buy these books for plot, let's say, or for entertainment, that they don't care as much about this kind of um, realism or this feeling of immersion? I think th- maybe, but I also think that maybe they just don't think of it in those terms i think 
there is a certain part of the population that won't be too distracted, won't think too much beyond just plot. But it seemed to me that there were quite a lot of people that were looking at Station Eleven as serious literature, too. So I don't think those people were just looking at the plot and feeling satisfied. At the same time, I, I don't know that I'd agree with you as far as commercial success. I think she did have a lot of commercial success and is getting a rebound of that now because of the virus. But, I mean, <laughs> Blindness was made into a movie. I think that book did quite well when it first came out. For me, I actually did find Station Eleven very engrossing. Um, but I think I also read more genre fiction than either one of you. So in a way, I I don't know if I've trained myself to be more forgiving of certain elements, um, because I definitely can see what you guys are talking about. But I felt very emotionally invested in the book. And I know that um, you guys did not feel as emotionally invested. No, and I I think we both enjoyed it for various reasons. I think that we're talking about different things here because first we were talking about realism and then it kind of shifted to being visceral and then it kind of shifted to being immersive and now we're talking about being emotionally invested. Are these things related necessarily? Because I think of them as distinct things. You're right, they are. Uh, I think of them as elements of making something realist. Like a realist work has to appeal to multiple levels in order to feel real. Um, I don't mean realist in the sense of um, style. I, I mean something feeling real as in feeling true, uh, feeling like it is something that could plausibly happen. You know, that kind of artistic suspension of disbelief that happens in fiction. Do you feel like Station Eleven was real? Yeah, I did. I mean, I was pretty invested in the book. Um, well, but then even if they're related, real and invested are, one is more emotional and one is more talking about the picture that was painted, right? Well, what I mean by invested is I'm willing to suspend my disbelief and go along with the story. I didn't stop and think, well, this doesn't feel real to me, or it didn't lose me midway. I think that a function or a result of a work feeling real is that it brings the reader along and it doesn't necessarily have to teach in my mind. So you don't necessarily have to glean any wisdom or knowledge from it, but you have to be able to follow along and want to read the story and be immersed in the story. So for me, the book did do that for me. It, it, it was real in that sense. I think where it kind of fell apart, which we discussed, was it wasn't as intellectually rigorous. Um, there's not a lot we can talk about. I don't know if I was emotionally invested in it, um, but I was immersed. I, I didn't have a problem with that. There weren't a lot of moments where I was rolling my eyes or anything like that. We talked about this. I mean, the biggest issue is the coincidence. That's the biggest problem, I think. Certainly one of them, yeah. All of these books have appealed to us to some degree. I don't think any of these books were bad necessarily, but what I want to know is why are people interested, particularly right now when we're experiencing our own pandemic, why are we interested in reading about other pandemics? Why is that appealing? So there is the Jerry Springer effect, which is that people will watch something that is a train wreck because then they can look at it and say, well, at least that's not my life. At least I'm better off than that. But I think there's there's more to it than that also. Yeah. Um, a lot of pandemic stories, barring certain genres like zombie movies, a lot of them end with hope or a message of positivity at some level. Pale Horse, Pale Rider is kind of mixed. Blindness is also sort of mixed, but is trending upward. And Station Eleven is completely hopeful. I don't know if people turn to these stories anticipating the positivity, but I think because of that positivity being an innate factor, I think it's you know one hand washing the other. I think they go together really well. And speaking of zombies, I'm also reminded of the conversations around imagined post-apocalyptic scenarios where people will speculate how they would gather necessary supplies and 
assemble a select team of survivors and do their best to live. There is some value in aligning or distancing oneself from the actions and feelings of the characters. Like, would I survive in this scenario? Would I die immediately? In an ironic way, is it escapism? Because it seems like we're retreating from real life by digging into our own problems that we have in real life. I think there is escapism certainly at play, but I don't know if you can just say that it's escapism and leave it at that. There's something more to it than that. I think it's a little bit different for me. Um, I think it's a cousin of escapism. I think it's similar to why people find speculative fiction interesting. Or like you mentioned, Sam, like zombies or post-apocalyptic fiction. It's a form of exploration. Um, Our world is really well mapped. Like we feel, even if it's true or not, um, we feel like we understand how our world works. And something like a pandemic kind of throws it all out because it's creating a new world. I think something like that is very appealing to people when they feel like everything is known, and then you have uh, a story that presents you with the unknown. You're talking here about the known and unknown worlds, but it seems like if people want to experience something unknown to them, they could do so without reading a pandemic novel in the midst of a real-life pandemic. Like, they could read some space exploration novels or some fantasy novels. Why specifically do people experiencing COVID-19 want to read about pandemics? I think people are always looking for answers, right? I mean, that's what religious texts are all built on. So one person might turn to the Bible for answers, while another might turn to fiction. In all of these books, fear of death plays at least some part. However, other fears are more thematically important. Uh, For me, what I saw in, in Pale Horse, Pale Rider, it's the fear of war or of others' death. In blindness, it's a fear of loss of humanity. And in Station Eleven, after the flu has erased 99% of the world, it's a fear of other people and, to some degree, cults. Um, I think that writing about death or fear of death is boring because it's something that everyone shares, but it's also inevitable. It's really hard to do well because it's so common. I, I'm saying that because I think that's why, to your point, like that's why these writers are focusing on these kind of other, you might even say subsidiary fears because they lead to death. But death itself, I mean, there's really not much you can talk about. The only book that off the top of my head tackles it really well is Gilead by um, Marilyn Robinson. Besides that, I mean, it's just so hard to have a book that actually meditates on death. Well, and, and like you were sort of getting to, fear of death in itself is, is not that interesting or nuanced. I mean, without the religious stuff coming in, it's you're alive and you're dead. Uh, But there's a lot more leading up to that. Fear of pain is kind of also boring and basic one, but then there's a lot more fear of illness and sickness. There's a lot more to it. Incidentally, something I found interesting in Station Eleven is in a world where most of the people die, it's actually kind of about isolation, how people need community, which is a very kind of safe thing to say and do in a work of fiction, of course. That's why you have this kind of fear in this um, post-apocalyptic world. You have these um, antisocial cultists or random murderers who keep people from building that connection. I think in a sense, status quo is very important to Station Eleven because I feel like there is a transformative event that happens in that novel where the world has a chance to start from scratch. And people like Clark are saying, we need to get back to where we were. And people like the prophet are saying, well, this is a chance to take a left turn and we can start in in God's image or in whatever image we want to. And I think that that's interesting is that the community-minded people are always the status quo sort of people, it seems, and the isolationist weirdos are always the villains. But Like I was saying in the previous episode, I think if that could have been reversed, it might have been interesting. Like maybe not returning to the status quo and the 
the heroes could be the people who are saying that there were problems in the status quo before the pandemic that could be rectified given this massive opportunity. Right, if it hadn't been such a straw man. Well, this is something I really want to talk about, actually, because I I think that what a pandemic narrative allows for the writer is an opportunity to kind of upend or critique the status quo, like you, as you put it, Yed. Um, so, I mean, to what degree do these three novels do this? And did you find any of these critiques of the status quo convincing? I think that blindness was the most successful because I think that the narrator is properly philosophical. Like he's willing to really dig into all of these issues and tackle them head on. I feel that Mandel, because she's so safe and because the novel really never escapes her persona, we never really get to confront the things that would challenge her persona and her worldview. It's very difficult to compare Porter and Pale Horse, Pale Rider to the other two novels because it's distanced from us through time, but also it's much more semi-autobiographical. So I feel like it's very difficult to hold that novel to the same measuring stick that we hold the other two. Porter does critique war. Yeah, that's actually kind of what I was going to say, that she was critiquing not just the war, but the treatment of the war, the the government officials that were pushing for uh, bonds sales and things like that. Well, that's absolutely true. But what I mean here is that the narrator of blindness is really eager to talk about things in a more head-on, direct way. Whereas it would be difficult for me to say that Miranda should be talking more about her feelings against the war, because in a sense, I see Miranda as a stand-in for Porter, and to ask Miranda to have said something different in the novel is asking Porter to have felt something different. So, yet yeah, you were saying how the narrator in Blindness was properly philosophical, but I think all three of us also found Blindness to be more relatable, and maybe all three of us are also properly philosophical. Do you think Maybe relatable is not the exact right word, but the reason perhaps why we found blindness to be more realistic or more true was because the level of philosophical examination kind of mirrored our own. Do you think that's why we felt more attuned to it? Whereas people who are, let's say, less philosophical might be more attuned to Station Eleven? It's possible. Um at the beginning of our talk today, we had said that blindness was more visceral, or at least that's my take on it. And when I say visceral, I don't necessarily mean realistic. I mean that it's emotionally impactful, because I feel like the the philosophical narrator in blindness is off-putting to some, and even for somebody like me who really enjoys philosophy it keeps you at a certain distance because it's always thinking about things in an analytic way or thinking about things in an abstract way. And I don't think that it's as inviting as the narration in Station Eleven. But what makes it visceral is not the narration, but rather the detail, the specific bodily detail, the disgusting detail that we find in Blindness. That's why I had that particular reaction. I think it's a separate thing from the narration. What do you think, Sam? I'd agree. Um, it wasn't the philosophical stuff that drew me to blindness. Um, it, it was probably the le level of detail. Yeah, I think the narration was interesting, but it probably served more to bring me out of the story then bring me into it. But I didn't find that a problem because of how immersed I was. The setting, the gloom, the abject horror that was going on. Yeah, I, I think that was part of what pulled me into blindness. And did you guys find any of these um, social critiques convincing? It's very difficult for me to really say that the critique in blindness is convincing only because I don't think it really aims to push us in one direction. The only general direction I think it pushes us in is that our societies are precarious and our 
use of reason as a way to control society is not as powerful as we think it is. And that's something that I had previously believed. So it's not something new that I was convinced of, but I did feel like it was speaking to me because it was saying ideas that I already believed in. I'd agree with that. And for Station Eleven, as far as critiquing existing order, th- there is a critique, but it, there's, it gets lost a little bit. There's this celebration of the pastoral and a return to that, but it, there's also at the same time the celebration of how things used to be, as I think, James, you were talking about before. And those two things don't really coexist. I think they're trying to at the end of the novel, trying to make those two things come together. But I think the celebration of the pastoral is a secondary thought. I don't know if that's what she was going for. Here's a question for both of you. It seems to me that Station Eleven is, whether or not Mandel realizes it, implicitly a conservative novel. It implicitly, it, it argues for the status quo. Do you think that's the case? I think it's something I might have mentioned in our episode in that um, that's why I feel like it's much more of a of a mystery novel because a mystery novel is a restoration of order and is inherently conservative in that manner. Not all mystery novels are like that. A lot of uh, newer mystery novels kind of upend that a little bit. Um, So I totally agree. I think it is conservative in that it, it kind of, moves back toward the status quo. It's saying the world we had was so good. Let's not think about how to change it. Let's just get back to it. Station Eleven has this conservative worldview, but it's not conservative in the sense that it wants to preserve something extreme, like uh, an anti-immigration stance or a white nationalist stance. It just wants to return to what I would imagine Mandel believes are her own particular secular progressive ideas. In the context of the novel, it's conservative only in that it's wanting to return to something antecedent, something prior to the events of the novel. Right. I mean, she's not taking a lot of risks. She wants everything to revert back. And that's not necessarily a criticism, I think, because not all novels have to argue for a new world order or anything. I don't think that they need to, but if you have this opportunity, as you said, that a pandemic is an opportunity for transformation, you're confronted with the opportunity for change. And if you refuse that opportunity, you are taking a stance. Whether or not you mean to take a stance, you are. Inaction is also action. Right. I agree. All right. Well, it sounds to me like we're going to take a break. And then when we come back, we'll talk about sexual arousal. Okay, so welcome back. We were just talking about cataclysms and the opportunity to upend the status quo. Now let's get to sex. Yed? Yeah, so earlier I was saying it was interesting to me why people in the middle of one pandemic are interested in reading about other pandemics. And that got me thinking about disaster in fiction in general. Pandemics are interesting, but people are also interested in reading about wars and earthquakes and pestilence and all of these kinds of big, huge changes. When I was looking on the internet about that, I learned about symporophilia, which is sexual arousal, which is caused by disaster, and also ot assassinophilia, which is arousal caused by the fear of death. I don't know about you guys, but those aren't my particular fetishes. I'm not trying to kink shame anybody, but that's not what I'm into. So, yeah, let me ask you, are these real? As real as Wikipedia can be trusted with. I mean, they exist. I haven't looked in DSM-4, or is it DSM-5 now? I haven't looked, but apparently there are people who are turned on in this way. 
I I buy it. I don't think it's... I don't buy it. I totally don't buy it. I feel like it's one (laughs) of those internet things that people make up to scare other people or to arouse other people. Well, what about more realistic or not realistic, but more common things? For example, you may have seen a lot of things being called porn now. I have. Uh, Disaster (laughs) porn, earthquake porn, abandoned porn. I think that people are attracted to destruction, even if it's not a sexual arousal, There is an appetite for destruction, and I think that something that might be at least partially responsible for the popularity of these things is the fact that nowadays life is safe. You know, modern science and technology have made life long and made life safe that perhaps something is missing. I can see the argument about modern science, but I don't know if I agree. I think that Humans have probably always had a morbid fascination with death and destruction, Um, not necessarily in a strictly perverse way, but a little bit more broadly, humans have always had a fascination with our fears. We can look to the oldest texts that still survive, not just religious texts, but epics and dramas and poems deal extensively in fears and death and destruction. I don't think it's the ever-increasingly longevity of human life, but the opposite, that we've always been fragile. No matter how long our life expectancy gets, we're still bags of flesh with a relatively short lifespan. But why are we drawn to that? Like, I understand that no matter what happens, we're always going to be weak to some degree, but it seems like that's something that people would want to run from. Is it just the spectacle of destruction that attracts us, or is there something else? I think a lot of people are attracted to danger, and so seeing danger and destruction and death from a distance allows you to experience that danger without putting yourself at risk. There's some draw to that. Well, it could be chemical. I mean, people do get an adrenaline rush from certain activities. Sure. I mean, the horror genre is pretty popular these days, in in movies especially. And that banks on that same kind of uh, draw. Well, did you have that kind of experience when you were reading these novels? Was there an adrenaline rush? No, but I wonder if that's just because I'm not that sort of person. I, I really enjoy horror, for example, but I don't get a you know a high from it. I don't I don't get any sort of arousal or anything like that. I doubt that there is a big overlap between the podcasting community and the extreme sports community. I think they're two <laughs> distinct groups. You don't think people are skydiving with a podcast? Oh, only if it's canonical. What I would want to say is, when I was reading Station Eleven, there were moments when the spectacle was attractive to me. For example, when they're walking beside the highway, and they see all of the cars that are stopped, and they can see all of the skeletons inside of the car. That image was very arresting, and it was very interesting to think of a row full of stopped cars that had been stopped for 20 years. Hmm. That was an interesting image. And also the idea when they're looking for musical instruments and they are looting the abandoned school. That also invoked a similar feeling in my mind. And it's something that actually I think is very attractive. I don't know if it's just me personally, but the idea of breaking into places that have been abandoned and looking for useful things and just seeing things that haven't been used in a long time That's very attractive to me. So I think that for me, it's much more spectacle than something else. But maybe, James, you have a different take? No, I agree. I think it is spectacle. And it's similar to what we were talking about before with this idea of escapism or just the idea of exploring a new frontier. I think presenting the audience with something they don't encounter regularly in their lives um, creates some kind of attraction. I don't think it's necessarily related to our lifespans, though. Well, Sam was saying that historically, these types of disaster narratives have always been attractive. But 
It seems to me, just anecdotally, a lot of people have been saying that young adult fiction is full of post-apocalyptic narratives. It seems like it's especially important nowadays, and especially appealing to people nowadays. Do you think that's true? I think there's always shifts in fiction and in in storytelling in general. There, there probably are other texts that we can point to, but... I think Cormac McCarthy's The Road was a pretty big beacon for signaling that, hey, it's okay to have post-apocalyptic fiction in literary circles now. And I think that opened a floodgate, and we're seeing quite a bit of post-apocalyptic fiction in, in every corner of literature these days. And I think that's just a shift that we're seeing. It might not be that big a deal in 20 years, or maybe this is something that's on everyone's mind these days. I think that in terms of art, it's always been present because these are human concerns. The destruction of what we built, the disintegration of our human bodies. But what's most interesting to me is right now, it seems like it's not just in the art sphere, but also in the entertainment sphere. Like destruction as entertainment is appealing to us. And that's just, it's odd. And my initial idea with the science and technology theory is that in our modern lives, a lot of people don't know people who have died in gruesome ways, or people who have been murdered, or people who have been attacked by a very vicious, deadly disease. It's something uncommon nowadays. And I feel like that's a particular part of human life that is vanishing. Slowly, it's vanishing. And maybe there's something that is missing from our experience. I don't think anybody would want these things to happen more frequently, but they add a certain flavor to life. So, yeah, do you think um, this kind of story is much different from people who would attend a public execution back in the day? I think that a public execution had a similar function, but I think the more important function of a public execution is the public display of justice and the public display of order. I think that was the more significant thing. I think that people wanted to be reminded that things were organized and that bad people would be punished in a reliable way. When I read these novels, I don't get any sort of social reinforcement. I don't feel like, oh, well, society is organized to punish the bad and to reward the good. It's just not part of the experience. When I read these novels, it's just about having a good time and enjoying myself. Well, maybe Station Eleven, though. You might say that Station Eleven, you you do get a thrill from the the deterioration of society, but at the same time, you also get a kind of thrill from the rebuilding of society. What about the death of the prophet? Do you feel like that gave you any sort of sense of like cosmic justice? The the death of the wicked? Kind of. Not not very much so. I think it it could have, but that was one of my biggest disappointments. It it felt anticlimactic. But I think in general, things like that in books usually do feel very justified and and very um, cathartic. Speaking of justice, these books, especially Blindness, uh, briefly highlight an ongoing issue that we see today where people seek to blame others for disease as scapegoats. Uh, We can go back to the bubonic plague in Middle Ages uh, for which Jews were frequently blamed. Uh, just as Chinese were blamed for an outbreak of the plague in San Francisco about a century ago. We still refer to the 1918 flu epidemic as the Spanish flu, even though it was spreading all over Europe and the rest of the world. And in Station Eleven, the pandemic is labeled the Georgian flu, though Mandel doesn't really deal too much with blame. And in the first sections of blindness, the thief is quick to blame the first blind man for his infection, even in the face of his own crimes. Is there any value to scapegoating, do you think? Do these books or others you've read satisfactorily condemn such accusations? I think that scapegoating is 
different from ascribing blame. I think scapegoating, of course, it's always wrong because scapegoating is finding somebody to blame for your problems who is not necessarily at fault. But where fault is reasonable, where we can say one group is at fault, I think that it's okay to kind of try to figure out who's responsible. So I don't think that any of these novels really cared too much about who was responsible for the particular pandemics. I don't think that it matters so much in blindness that it was uh, the thief getting the blindness from the first blind man. I think it would be much more significant if it were talking about the blindness coming from a neighboring country. Yeah, I, I guess blindness I singled out as being the closest to dealing with this issue, not because they're dealing with different populations and ascribing blame to a certain population, but it's the only book that really talked about uh, the infection starting with maybe one person, even though we know that the blindness just appeared. As far as we're told, it just appears and then disappears. But they do talk about how pointless it is to try and blame other people because they're all blind. I think that that was very well done on Saramago's point, because I think one of the philosophical ideas that he wants to deal with is the inevitability of certain things and that certain disasters or certain problems will come up regardless of our efforts to control or contain them. And it's not the result of anybody's moral failing or anybody's lack of due diligence that this epidemic of blindness takes hold of the country in the novel. It's just pure happenstance. I think that was done very deliberately. Yeah, I I kind of agree with you, Yet, um, and I disagree a little bit in that I don't think looking for the root cause is that useful in a lot of situations. I think that what blindness and Station Eleven both kind of emphasize is the cause of the disease doesn't matter as much as the question of how to cope with the reality that you're facing at the moment. We do have the prophet in Station Eleven who says, you know, God has created this kind of disease as a way of punishing the unworthy. And I think that we, as rational people, we want to find the cause of things because we think that will help us solve the problem, but it just doesn't always do do that. Like, I don't think the finding the cause is always the answer. Um, and it seems that Station Eleven and Blindness both kind of reinforce that to me. That reminds me, too, of how Station Eleven does give us the opposite to that. And we talked about this a little bit in that episode, that Clark provides the opposite view, that this has nothing to do with God, this has nothing to do with blame, necessarily. It's just something that happened. They survived this awful thing just by coincidence, and the awful thing happened by coincidence. It's not something that anyone could have predicted, per se, or avoided. It's something that happened, and like you put it, now they have to deal with it and move on. Okay, let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll uh, close our discussion on pandemic literature. We'll be right back. back. So let's close with just kind of a, a general discussion about pandemic literature. Did you guys learn anything about this subgenre? I don't know if learned anything about the genre as as far as the genre itself, except that 
it's definitely a growing interest in our population. Uh, we're seeing a lot more of it, as we discussed earlier. Um, it's accepted not just as something literary and something worth exploring, but also we're seeing today that there's an appetite for it. There's a lot of people that are very interested, whether it's the porn aspect that he had mentioned, or if there's some, some sort of comfort to it. And it's definitely not going anywhere anytime soon. I think the biggest thing that I learned is what you had mentioned a while back about how most authors use pandemics as a plot device. It's just a shortcut from daily life to post-apocalyptic life. And the big promise for me with Pale Horse, Pale Rider is that it would be different from that. And I guess what I am looking for now in this genre is a more nuanced way of dealing with pandemics. I think Pale Horse, Pale Rider, it, it moves in that direction, but it's not all the way there. I would like to find fiction that more accurately expresses the particular anxieties that I'm living through right now. Do you think that um, now that we have read these books, do you think that pandemic literature is very different from other kinds of post-apocalyptic literature? I think it can be if it's focused more on the experience of the pandemic as blindness is rather than the aftermath like Station Eleven is. I think that if it's destruction and death that's caused by people dying of a pandemic, it's not really substantially different if they die of a pandemic rather than dying of a war or an alien invasion. It's all pretty much the same. What's kind of interesting to me is if you take post-apocalyptic fiction um, written like, let's say, decades ago, they tend to be as a result of nuclear fallout because that's what people were dealing with back then, this threat of nuclear war um, and nuclear winter. But what's interesting to me now is that that fear has kind of receded and instead it's... Uh, pandemics, which kind of arise from this interconnectedness of our world. You know, it's this kind of uh, threat of modernity or of our contemporary interconnected life. That's what's interesting to me about pandemic literature. Yeah, that's a good angle. I hadn't really considered that. I do think that for me, pandemics are interesting in a in a sense, but I still think that nuclear war is also interesting in a different sense, only that it reintroduces the aspect of human agency. And I think that with human agency, there is a much clearer chain of causation and therefore blame. If we go back to what Sam was asking about earlier, I think that that aspect of who's starting the war is also very appealing to me, particularly in fiction. It is, to combine both of your thoughts, it is interesting to look back and see what people as a population were interested or scared of uh, by looking at their fiction and their various forms of media. For example, after nuclear radiation, there's a whole lot of alien things. And then after that, at some point, we turn to robotics as... Sharks. <laughs> sharks. <laughs> yeah. It, Robotics in, I'm thinking of like the Terminator, but then that has morphed since then into AI as being a huge fear. And pandemics have been in literature and in movies for a while, but I think we're definitely seeing more of it now. All of those things are fears of rapid advancement of science without uh, restriction. And it's kind of interesting to think about that they're all part of the same bigger genre. This isn't a fully formed thought in, by any means, but I think it's interesting to think about pandemics in contrast to AI, just because AI is kind of this fear of a loss of connection or a loss of humanity, whereas pandemics arise as a result of too much connection, too much contact. 
You think so? I mean, I think that that is part of AI, but I think also it's the fear of an intelligence that we've created, a, a scientific marvel that we've created that is no longer in our control and has in fact surpassed us. Did I say AI meant sharks? <laughs> I agree with uh, James with regard to AI and probably also to sharks. It's the idea that the things that human beings particularly are good at are no longer going to be valued. And the Mm. things that computers are good at, computation and prediction and collation, are so much more valuable that the human place in the world is going to be shrinking and perhaps eventually eliminated. So it sounds to me, Ed, that uh, you're looking forward to reading more COVID-specific books in the future. What about you, Sam? Are you looking forward to these books? I would be interested in learning more about COVID, but I'm not necessarily looking for COVID-specific things. Actually, James, yeah. No, James, you got me wrong. I actually probably don't want to read anything about pandemics or COVID for a while, especially if it's something (laughs) written, you know, right now, it would just seem kind of like an opportunistic cash grab. Like I'm sure in 10 years or 20 years, there will be enough distance from the event to write about it in a meaningful and artistic way. But if something comes out next year, I'll be a little bit hesitant yeah, kind of like three guys who do a podcast about pandemic books <laughs> in the middle of a pandemic. Pretty much. I mean, these publishers, I, I was reading a report today about how all these publishers are snatching up all these um, writers who have pandemic type projects in the pipeline. So they're expecting a huge audience. I think that there is a huge market just because people use art as a way to make sense of reality and this epidemic has really been something that people have had trouble making sense of. So I think that there is a huge appetite for a novel that will explain people's experience to them. That's kind of what I'm looking forward to. I'm not really looking forward to any COVID-specific novels or other works of art, but I'm really looking forward to seeing what this kind of forced isolation does to people and uh, like what, what kind of weird frictions that are caused by these drastic changes in our lives and how that manifests itself in fiction. That's what I'm really interested in. All right, let's conclude here. Thank you for listening. Uh, If you have feedback for us, you can find us at Canonical Pod. We are on Twitter and Facebook, and we have a subreddit now at our Canonical Pod. If you want to leave us some comments or leave us some feedback, we'd love to hear from you. We'll be back in two weeks with a discussion on Sag Harbor by Colson Whitehead. It's the first book in our Race in Contemporary America series. Um, If you're interested in following our discussion, if you want to get an early start on reading, please go ahead and find that copy of Sag Harbor. If you want to support us, you can use our affiliate link below. Till next time, happy reading. We'll talk to you soon.